what I like to see. Tax strips getting ready to go down. He's, he's lining it up for his pops. His pops is in the other room. Of course, when you put this tack strip down, it's got all those little nails sticking up at an angle, and you want to face those facing the wall so when they stretch the carpet, it grabs. I think you've done this a few times, Billy. Yeah, once or twice. That's a slick little cutter there for us. What's that? I'm just saying, a slick little cutter you have there. Alright. And you just eyeball it or you make it about a, a finger or so? Uh, it just depends on the thickness of the carpet. It's enough of a gap for the carpet to roll over that, over the pad, the pad stops into here, and then the carpet goes over, and then it kind of slips down in there underneath the, uh, the baseboard. That's why generally when you install a baseboard, you hold it up on the floor like that. Almost looked like he was using a hammer tacker there for a second, but no, that's a hammer. And they gotta be they gotta be careful when they're when they're hammering it down. It, you gotta be careful because you don't want to hit the baseboard. Because the baseboard has already been nicely cleaned, sanded, and painted. See, so it doesn't matter. That's probably, oh, I don't know, three quarters of an inch or so. But he just kind of takes his finger. He just takes his finger and kind of holds it up there. There you go. He was in this room for, oh, I don't know, five minutes? Let's see how 
little bit of steel. Okay, well, not much to show you about carpet tack strip other than get it installed properly. Of course, if you're nailing this down onto concrete subfloor, you, you, they have different tack strip with little concrete nails in it. And then that's more, that gets a little tricky. But on a wood subfloor, it goes pretty quick when you know what you're doing. ready to set pad here in a minute. Now, do you see a common theme here? You want to maintain that gap all the way along all of your walls. You see there? Even around your door frames. Okay? See how he leaves that slight little gap there? And it's different when the doors when the doors are installed, they always like to lift them up off the ground. They, they make a decision, whoever's installing the doors and frames usually is the same person who installs the, the baseboard. So if there's a gap, if they decide that they want a gap underneath the baseboard by uh, five eighths of an inch, three quarters of an inch, let's say, then they would raise their door frames up about three quarters of an inch. You see there? See, the door frames are not down tight to the floor, are they? when they install them. The idea is when you, when you cut your carpet, you cut it long. You, after you stretch it, you cut it long, and then you, and you, then you slip it underneath the door frame, underneath the door uh, casing, underneath the baseboard. If you have your baseboard down tight to the floor, or only up off the floor by an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch, and, your, and let's say your door jams were installed tight to the floor or an eighth of an inch up, or something now you can't slip your carpet underneath there you've got to cut your carpet almost precise and then kind of tap it down in there you're going to mark up your baseboard a little bit and all that kind of stuff and, and incidentally talking about marking up baseboard when they install the carpet they're going to have to be careful because the carpet uh backing is really rough like sandpaper so when it rolls up they're good they'll be careful and and when they cut it, they'll still kind of be careful as they're poking it down in there or else it's going to scratch. The back side of the carpet's going to scratch all the nicely painted baseboard. You got that on any job. Okay, so the carpet guys know that, but I'll, I'll, 
I'll probably be mindful and just tell him and he'll probably have a chuckle like, yeah, I know, I know, okay, whatever. So, anyways, that's, that's how it's going to look. Now, on, on most rooms, if you got a really super long uh, room, let's say, a playroom or something like that, and depending how long it is, sometimes, sometimes carpet layers like to put two rows, two rows of tack strip along the end walls that they're going to stretch because then they use a, a power stretcher and, and they stretch it and they want more grab because they're stretching it pretty hard. Sometimes if you only have one carpet tack strip, you could have a tendency of tilting that, pulling it away from the wall. I've never seen it happen, but uh, I've seen some, some carpet guys have told me uh, that's why they do it, okay? It, it gives a little bit more meat for the backside of the carpet to, to grab on there too. You don't want, you know, when you're stretching it that far, you don't want the back of the carpet to kind of uh, stretch or slightly tear because it's only on a couple nails, you know. So, uh, but this particular room, he doesn't need to do that. It's not. It's not long enough. It's not long enough for that. So he feels fine with just one row. I'm right up against the tile. Yeah. You, you don't need anything finished. Just leave your gap like that, and the carpet's going to roll down in there. It'll look good when it gets done. You know, there's different applications, different times where they, they might do something slightly different than this. If, if they're going over the top of a uh, linoleum floor or hardwood floor or, you, you know, if there's something else there. So there's different, different ways to do um, carpet transitions, I would call that. Okay. See here? You look nice. Looks like they know what they're doing. I feel pretty confident about these guys. Everything's fine. The first thing this morning when I got here, of course, of course, I had to hook up the uh, uh, the dryer, get that pushed back in there, get the washing machine back there. That, that was my priority this morning. Get get that pushed back in there and get it out of the way. So I was out of the way of them. And yesterday, when I cleaned up, I pulled up the craft paper, and I had it taped nicely along the edge. A little, little bit of paint got down in there from the baseboard, so I had enough time to clean that. And the transition uh, down where the, where the dryer vent connection is up against the wall had a big gap around it, so I was able to caulk that nice and clean, let that dry overnight so that I could... Uh, uh, put this in this morning rather than yesterday and uh, it Looks like it's always meant to be huh? Although I've got I've got two coats of paint on the ceiling. I did flat white the first time uh, And then I put a semi-gloss white paint over that for the second coat the first coat wasn't covering 100% because it was over that tan beige ceiling Okay and then I did the walls, and I did the walls uh, semi-gloss because it's in the washer and dryer area. And got all the baseboard painted, the door casings painted, both sides. They look nice. Nice and clean, man. Almost looked like I know, knew what I was doing, huh? Look how tight these lines are. You know? That is paint where I tied in, cut in this paint to the door casings. Remember, I painted the door casings first, overlapped it, made sure I got all everything nicely painted on the sides, okay? And then some of the white paint got on to the wall, and I didn't care about that because I could only get this so close anyways with the roller. So I already had a gap like this on both sides. And so I did the door casings first, then I then I cut this little section in with a cut-in paintbrush. Looks like it was meant to be. Man, it just turned out so nice. I, I finished this yesterday. Man, that, that, that took a while. Just painting all that with a little mini roller. I used a mini roller, a six-inch mini roller. 
and and my uh, roller cover was that three quarter inch nap roller, but I had used that for ceilings, and uh, it ended up being like a, a three eighths nap funky roller. And I thought, hey, that's good enough. I'm not gonna th I'm not gonna throw that roller cover away yet. So I used it in here, and then I used a crummy throwaway two inch paintbrush to get all of my inside corners. I had to cut in this, cut in this, cut in this, cut in this, cut in this. Top and bottom of the shelves on the back side of this, back side of that. It's not looking really good. The only other thing I'm going to do, this is eggshell. The only other thing I'm going to do is on the tops of these, I'm going to paint, uh, I'm going to cut it in with the paintbrush and stuff, and I'm going to put uh, semi-gloss on there. And what I could do, I could use just a four inch mini roller and just get it as close as I can if I wanted and just do the top and not even worry about cutting it in. But I'll cut it in too. That's just how I do things. And that, you know, I could leave this whole thing with just uh, eggshell finish on here. It's better than having flat paint on these wood shelves. But because I've got the semi-gloss, because I did the, I did this room uh, semi-gloss. I also did a room downstairs and I've got uh, two bathrooms and I'm going to use the semi-gloss and so this little pantry Shelf area and then there's one down at the kitchen kitchen area that kind of looks exactly like this right up the hallway Next to the on the back side of where the refrigerator is I've got to do the same thing down there and I'll probably put semi-gloss on those too Just because I can